It's not only about the bragging rights. It's about representation, prowess, flexibility and adequate information for a solution-focused initiative. We crowned a champion in the third edition of the Speak and Solve initiative, SASI. It was a tough challenge, but an ultimate winner emerged. Taking the trophy, which has been in the custody of the Harare Institute of Technology, the Midland State University held the cup for the first time, marking themselves as the team to beat in the fourth edition of the SASI debate. They fought a good fight. Will they follow in the footsteps of their predecessors and be the winners this year? Do they have what it takes to take it home yet again? The family decided that, you know what, we should get a doctor. They come and test everyone else. Everybody get tested. Then we see what we do from there. But nobody should go outside. We should just stay in our homes. Then I discovered ah, I was COVID positive. I didn't know what to tell or what should I tell my friends, you know, how it was. It got to me the following day. When now people are now showing you that you are now different. Right? You are now different. You need to stay on your own. You need to do stuff on your own. People are wearing masks around the house. People are wearing gloves around the house. People are eating on their own. And then you are on your own. They talk to you, but it's just one of those. You know how it is. They try to make you feel comfy, but then it's different. So that's when it's really struck me that, you know what, I'm positive. And I might just die. The same way these guys did. Yes, people are dying, but you can recover. Because let me tell you one thing that kills people the most. Um, it is the psychological mindset. That's what kills people. The moment you have that thought, fine, you're sick. But the moment you realize that you're sick and it's bad, it even gets worse. But you are sick and then you realize that, you know what, I know it could be okay, it could be fine. Staying positive at all times. Hello, my name is Nadia Mutisi. I'm a second year law student at the University of Zimbabwe. My name is Ebenezer Kudita from the University of Zimbabwe. I'm very excited to be part of the 2021 SASI debate competition. I think last year we came so close, but this year we're more than confident and ready that we are bringing the trophy home this year. I think we've come so close so many times, and every other time that we came so close, we went back and we got the trophy. So definitely, University of Zimbabwe is coming to conquer in 2021. Uh, my message is very clear that this year things are going to be different. This year they will see a team that they've never seen before and they are most definitely going to lose this year. So the battle continues on the fourth edition of the SASI debate competition. And now in the building, we have Africa University and they're going up against the University of Zimbabwe. Guys, how are you feeling? You're closer to the semi-finals, you make it or you don't. How are you feeling? Um, quite good. Um, hopefully we'll make it to the semi-finals. Nadia, Nadia, you have nothing to say. We're feeling, I guess, ready. Ready. Okay, how are you feeling? A bit of nerves, but okay. So what's this? Are you cold? Like I'm, I'm keeping myself composed. <laughs> Before you've even started debating. <laughs> and you, how are you feeling? Uh, yes, a bit nervous, but um, we're ready. You're ready? Yes. All right, if you're ready, I am. Our motion is, this house believes that individuals who break COVID-19 lockdown requirements while know unknowingly infectious should be liable for culpable homicide. Now, I'm going to read that again. This house believes that individuals who breach COVID-19 lockdown requirements while unknowingly infectious should be liable for culpable homicide. You have the same motion? You have the same motion? All right. And our affirmative team is the University of Zimbabwe. Our Posers are Africa University. I'm going to take us through the regulations once again because we've lost some time. All right. 
So affirmative, you will give us your opening speech and it is now three minutes, okay? Once you've done that, opposers, you will then have one minute to cross-examine uh, the affirmative team. Once you're done with your cross-examination, your opening speech opposers will also be three minutes, all right? The affirmative team will also cross-examine you for a minute. Then we'll come back to the opposers for their rebuttal, which is three minutes. Affirmative, your rebuttal is also uh, three minutes. Once we're done with that, we then move to our closing remarks. We will start with the opposers, then end with the affirmative team. And that is now two minutes. Are we clear on our timing? All right. Right. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> Your clock starts now. <coughs> the world has been the world has been under a lot of threat for the past two and a half years of COVID-19, meaning that we are officially at a war against the coronavirus. How then do we best deal with the situation of coronavirus and how do we help curb the spread? The biggest spreaders of the COVID-19 virus is the issue of people who break down regulations. Governments have, and, and experts have sat down and come up with solutions on how we curb the spread. And the individuals who still call, go on and violate these regulations for different reasons, one or the other, most of them being unjustified. The burden that we have today as the University of Zimbabwe is to prove to you why, number one, these people are not uh, should be found liable and why their contribution will and how this will then help solving the problem of COVID-19. First of all, let's begin with the issue of deterrence. <coughs> What you need to understand is that very, people understand that the consequence of breaking lockdown, re lockdown regulations is a very small price to pay. For example, in Zimbabwe, people are paying 500 RTGs, or, um, 500 RTGs, which is a very small price to pay, considering that these people are literally risking the lives of each and every single individual in the country. The, each regulation that you break exposes yourself to exposing a lot of people. So globally, one person has the potential to infect 59,000 people in terms of ripple effect. You boil that down to Zimbabwe, where a single individual has the potential to affect about 2,000 individuals. We talk about buses, we talk about the people at home and all those people then spread. Meaning that if the percentage of death is the 2%, you have a situation whereby 20 people are being caused to die because of a single action. Meaning that each individual and any action that you cause, that pro like, like lowering your mask and all this lockdown regulation, directly contributes to the loss of life of someone else. And you can't just say that is a, something that's punishable by $500. We think we need to have a real looking in terms of how that happens. What we're then saying is that with these people, when they breach regulation, they are they are liable for couple for homicide. What is couple for homicide? Within couple homicide is the killing of someone through negligence. The intention may not to be may not to kill, but by virtue of the negligence, that is the outcome. We're not saying that these people intentionally wanted to do something, but because that they are because of their negligence and the breaking of the law, that then resulted in the death of another individual. And when someone dies, someone needs to be accountable. We are losing lives, and all these things are happening, and no one is being accountable because we think we're not taking this seriously. Number one. Secondly, we'll tell you how then this also provides a societal discourse. Once we implement such a policy, it means that people are more cognizant, not just of the lockdown regulations, but also cognizant about the coronavirus and how to spread it. Like when you have the policy, a policy as drastic as this, it means that people, number one, are following rules now, but also more importantly, are having conversations, conversations with friends, conversations with families about how best do we deal with the solution of COVID-19, start masking up, steaming, all the other remedies that have been implemented in society. But also we need to look at the social contract that we have. Each and every single individual has a social contract from the moment you're born. You have a responsibility not just to your government, but a responsibility as a member of society to keep each and every single person safe. I'm not saying you have a responsibility to go up and help everyone, but you have a responsibility to do the bare minimum to ensure that everyone else, you are a member of the community. And people who break lo lockdown regulations are putting people at risk, and more often than not, they do not understand the extent of the risk. And by so doing, we're then saying that... Okay, thank you very much. You could have tried. You could have really tried. You like had a second. You could have said so much. No, I'm joking. All right. Um, are you ready with your cross-examination? Yes. Your clock starts now. All right. Mr. Speaker, what's your definition of culpable homicide? Uh, I'll repeat it. The killing of someone through negligence. The intention may not to be killed, but by virtue of negligence. By negligence, I just mean by not being serious or taking or being reckless. Okay, thank you. Are you also aware that they, there's still intention to kill in the act of breaching these lockdown requirements. You know, if there's an intention to kill, all the more reason that they should be charged for homicide. Can you please clarify? I'm saying, if you are saying that they, uh, there's an intention to kill by breaking regulations, it means then, therefore, then they, there's no need for us to debate. Because if the intention to kill, then it's clear made. Okay. Twenty-two seconds. No more questions. Yeah, yeah no more. Come on, mm. guys. Think of one. Just one more. Get them in the corner. Okay, they cede their time to me, um, which then means 
I will now ask you to give your opening remarks and your time starts now. Ladies and gentlemen, this house does not believe that individuals who breach COVID-19 lockdown requirements should be liable for culpable homicide, whilst knowingly infectious should be liable for culpable homicide. As the opposition, we actually think that this is a lighter sentence to people who actually breach COVID-19 regulations. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to clearly know that when one breaches COVID-19 regulations, they are intentionally doing it. They actually know that there is a risk of them actually contracting the disease. What we are saying as the non-affirmative is saying that culpable homicide is actually a lighter sentence. When you're held with culpable homicide, you're actually doing it without the intention. But breaching COVID-19 regulations, ladies and gentlemen, you have the intention. Hence, it is then qualified as murder. Ladies and gentlemen, our own aim here, it is actually to curb the spread of COVID-19 um, virus, ladies and gentlemen. The, co the conditions for murder is unlawful. It is actually showing that the law of being unlawful here is actually being applied because someone is actually breaching. If we wanted to, to make things worse, this is a state of emergency. One should actually then be further charged with treason, ladies and gentlemen, because it is a presidential um, command that has been passed, and then people should be able to actually follow this presidential command, ladies and gentlemen. I actually think by actually giving them the choice to uh, then later in life get bail, actually get the chance to appear up, upon the, a court of law, is actually lighter. Let them be charged by murder. Let them be face actual, let them face life imprisonment. When I go out in the public, I know that I am actually going to contract um, COVID-19. And I actually know that maybe I am unknowingly infectious and I do not care. Hence, you know what you are doing. We are dealing with a population that has got logic. Zimbabwe has got the highest educational rate in, Zimb in, in Africa. Hence, we are not dealing with a population of toddlers. Hence, these people are aware that what I am doing has repercussions. Hence, let them meet these repercussions. Let them actually be filed and actually be cased with murder. And as, as the non-affirmative, we stand still and stand firm with this. In actual, we actually think that this is not capable homicide? No, it's not capable homicide because there was actually intention. Hence, because there was intention, it qualifies to be murder. Hence, this is a lighter sentence. We are demanding a higher sentence, and with this, we rest our case. 28 seconds and wow, that was quite a plot twist. Um, okay. Are you ready with your cross-examination? Ready. I'm, yeah. Sorry. I, your clock starts now. Okay, so, um, Madam Speaker, um, do you understand the difference between murder and culpable homicide? Can you explain that? Um, culpable homicide is the negligent killing mm -hmm. of um, the next party. Was uh, murder is killing with intent. You know what you're doing, you're using logic, hence it is murder. Okay, so you want to go against the criminal law code of Zimbabwe and tell us that the criminal law code is wrong and that you want to say that um, in culpable homicide, well, in this particular case, you're saying that negligence then now becomes murder. Statutory, instru um, statutory instrument 27 actually shows you that um, when someone is doing things with the intent, it is actually murder. With culpable homicide, let me give you an instance. Someone is driving a car and then he, uh, he or she actually hits a person on the road. Now that is negligent okay. and that is culpable okay. homicide. Thank you very much. I think, do you understand that where you have essential elements that are meant to be met, if you then say that it's murder and then you go to court and then those essential elements are not met, you actually will not be convicted? You can be convicted. When you don't meet the essential elements? This, this is the thing. Essential elements are being met here Hi. because there is intent. Let's breathe, ladies. Breathe. Okay. Opposers, your rebuttal, are you ready? Yes. All right, your clock starts now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is my duty as second speaker of the non-affirmative delegation to offer a rebuttal to the points raised by the affirmative delegation and to, to prove how irrelevant their points are in the debate in session and further emphasizing on our argument that this House does not believe individuals who breach COVID-19 lockdown requirements. Uh, this house does not believe individuals who breach COVID-19 lockdown regulations while unknowingly infectious should be should be charged should be charged with culpable homicide. We're saying that they should be legally answerable 
for murder instead. I'm going to give a rebuttal to the points raised by the first speaker of the affirmative delegation, saying that breaches are the primary spreaders of the virus and that these spreaders do not understand the risks involved. Breaches are not the only spreaders of the virus, as other people as well can spread. Um, people at home, they can also spread the virus unknowingly to others within their, within their confines. Going to further state that whether you know that you're infectious or not, chances of contracting and spreading the virus is still highly probable when you breach these lockdown requirements. Culpable homicide is murder in the act if the act is committed with an intention with, with a negligent intention to cause death and breaches are well aware of the consequences of breaching and should be prosecuted for murder for their non-compliance to the lockdown requirements stated by the law. We believe that this is actually treason to the statute stated by the government that people should adhere to these lockdown requirements. By breaching these lockdown requirements, they are actually, in, they are actually contradicting what the law states that people should stay at home in order to curb the spread of the virus to, to others. We also believe that citizens uh, use logic in their decisions. Thus, they know that they should not break or breach the lockdown requirements as this could cause the further spread of the virus and potentially killing um, others by infecting them. Breaches, if it, breaches do have um, some negligent intention to kill because they are well aware of the consequences of not, require, of not adhering to requirements. Time. All righty. Affirmative. Are you ready with your rebuttal? Yes, your we're clock ready. starts now. All right, so panel, what we understand from what we're hearing from side non-affirmative is that they believe that it is better for us to put a sentence such as murder. We think that in this particular debate, there has been a misunderstanding of what the motion actually says. The motion says that you are... To you, Nadia? All right, thank you. Um, the motion says that you are unknowingly infectious. What that means is that you don't actually have a guilty mind. You're not saying that I want to go out and I want to kill 500 people. No, you don't even know that you're infectious. So just going out, you're breaking COVID-19 regulations, and you do not know that you are infectious. What that means is that you do not have a guilty mind. You don't meet the mens rea that is needed for you to then um, be liable for something like murder, right? Their policy then becomes ineffective in this particular sense. We take someone who has then like breached COVID-19 regulations, and then we say we're trying you for murder. We take you to court, and then the judge is like, no, this actually doesn't meet the essential elements of this particular crime. What happens to that person is that they go home scot-free. Another thing that we have to talk about is how when you then put such a thing as murder, which in, in our society is seen as something that is extremely heavy, and it's an extreme penalty, right, in our society. Actually, in, in, our, in our society as well, something like murder can actually be lie, like you can then get the death penalty for something like murder, right? So we think, panel, in this particular instance, that where you then say that we're going to give you a, such a heavy penalty for something that you did because you, you did not know. We think that you lose trust with the rest of society. We think that it's not reasonable for the courts to even do that we think that in, in, in essence you're not even able to, to convict these particular people but at the same time people no longer take the courts seriously anyway so when something like domestic violence occurs and something of those so people can't even take their cases to the courts because they can't even trust the, the courts in that particular instance what we're seeing from our side of the house is that the measure that we're putting in place is very effective and it's very reasonable because it's culpable homicide we think that this uh, the other delegation shoots themselves in the foot where they come and say oh no we need a heavier penalty in which case the heavier penalty is going to cost the courts so much more we think that even in this particular case the heavier penalty also does not allow people to then what to then allow for convictions and all of that so panel what essentially are we saying from our side of the house what I've essentially come to tell you from our side of the house is that it's very important for us to look at the retributive model in terms of law right what that retributive model states is that in a, in a, in a certain society everybody has rights and everybody has responsibilities where you take away somebody else's life something that is something also has to be taken away from you as well right so panel what we're essentially telling you in this particular case is that we need something that is very effective something that the society is going to see and something that the society is also going to to, to be able to agree with right so panel essentially Essentially, we tell you that in, in, on our side of the house, we have to look at which side gives you a more, a more effective solution. We think that their solution is not effective, particularly when it comes to the courts and people being serious in terms of these particular things and that you're not even going to get a conviction when, when it comes to that, right, panel? So we tell you that, in, in essence, where they have like failed to be able to identify 
to, to, to identify what the key elements or what this motion actually requires then lose this particular debate and that gives us no room to be able to argue against anything because they failed to like to, to understand the motion we think that in this particular case we need something that is reasonable something that is going to be effective and something that the world over is going to look at we think that all over the world people look at presidents right we are sitting president and then if, if, we, if we come and say that I'm um, this particular case we're going to try you for murder and all of that stuff right we think that it sets a bad president for like future cases that are going to take place within our society we think that is very important for for the judiciary to remain just to remain reasonable and to remain relevant in this particular case okay closing remarks opposers are you ready your <coughs> clock starts now they say that when someone um, breaches COVID-19 re regulations and is unknowingly inf infectious Please turn does, the mic to you. does not actually um, have a guilty mind. The fact that you are breaching COVID-19 regulations, ladies and gentlemen, that is where our point is. When you breach COVID-19 regulations, you know that your chances of contracting the virus and spreading the virus are actually high, ladies and gentlemen. Hence, before, because of that, you do have some guilty conscience when you're moving around. What if I contract the COVID-19 virus? What if then I take it home and spread it to my family? Now, that is murder, ladies and gentlemen. The death penalty which they state, ladies and gentlemen, has been actually revoked. It does not exist. In actual fact, you actually see that people who have been charged with murder, they actually get life imprisonment. Ladies and gentlemen, I actually think that this stance that we have taken is actually a good stance. It shows that they were actually unprepared for us to take this stance. They actually expected us to bring us something different onto the table. We actually have taken things into a different direction. Criminal law at its best. At this moment, we are seeing that if someone has actually broken the law, by breaching COVID-19 regulations, has actually disrespected the president, has actually disrespected the state of emergency. Ladies and gentlemen, don't you think actually that can actually lead you to being fined with murder, ladies and gentlemen? With this, I actually don't have anything to say as they have brought nothing to the table. People should be charged with murder. Murder is murder. Negligent, unlawful, and legally explained actions actually result as a condition of murder. With this, I rest my case. All right, with 18 seconds to go. Uh, team Affirmative, let's have your closing remarks. Your clock starts now. Um, first of all, I, I thank God that my partner is a law student, which has allowed me to understand that op uh, opposition case is very flawed. When you're dealing with law, there are two things that you need to understand. When a crime, when someone kills someone accidentally, which is unknowingly, as the motion clearly states, it can never be murder. For you to accuse someone of accusing murder, they need to be two things, mens rea and actus rea, mens rea being a guilty mind. Did this person have the intention to kill? One. Two, did this, does the act lead to death? When, the mo when you read the motion, it says that this person is unknowingly infectious. So if you do not know you have the COVID-19 virus, there is no way you have an intention to kill because you don't, you don't know you have something. We show that the entire case and that they bring, what they bring to this table does not actually make sense in the confines of this debate. One. Two, we need to also understand that when you mention a policy, the policy needs to be reasonable. Is it reasonable for us to accuse someone of treason, which is punishable by death, or for murder, for something that they did not know? We both agree that, COVID, that, 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 that breaking lockdown regulations is something that, that causes loss of life. I think I'm happy that, that they agreed with us on that. What we then differed on in today's debate was the extent of the punishment. They say that this person has been negligent. And by virtue of you, negligent and intent are not the same thing. They want something that has, that has a requirement of intent, but the entire speech they talked about how negligence. Meaning that if they concede to negligence and they concede to unknowing, it means that it can only be coupled for homicide in terms of how this debate needs to happen. But also what else then happens in this debate? We also need to understand, panel, that the criminal law code of Zimbabwe has defined certain things and defined how our legal structure should work, right? Meaning that there are certain things that by definition or by our criminal law code cannot be classified or not be charged under certain things. If we go ahead with their policy, what then, that, what then means that you have people who are being tried for murder and people who get away scot-free because they do not meet the requirements that Nadia has been telling you about. Meaning that so it is important for us to understand that our laws, yes, need to be just, but also need to be reasonable. And we are the re only reasonable team in this debate. Thank you very much. All right. So, team affirmative. Those markers, what happens? Like... Are you like saying I've said this and I've said that and yes, that I haven't also. said this and how are those working? It, allow, it allows you to like, when you have a lot of things to say, it allows you to highlight the most important things of the, so that you don't leave out the important things since okay. time is so short. more organized. Okay. All right. All righty. So.
If you're just joining us, you're watching this Assay Debate Competitions 2021. This is the fourth edition. Of course, we've had, from the beginning, we had 10 teams competing, 10 universities from across Zimbabwe competing for this trophy. Take home the ultimate title of debate champion. Now we are down to eight teams. My maths is correct, right? Before I said we were four, and then I was just confusing myself. We have seen uh, three teams go up against each other so far. We are left with one round in this particular stage, um, after which we head to the semi-finals. But I do want to ask you, should you, you were you watching, should you be charged with murder if you breach the COVID-19 lockdown rules? Should you? And if not, what do you think is a better punishment? Let's hear from you in the comment section. Remember the hashtags to use are hashtag Sassy for Hope and hashtag Sassy Debate 2021. We'll be right back with the last teams. Welcome back to the Condomized Desk. And here again, I have. Dean Miti, who is from Africa University, where we also want to ask them what they are doing also as um, leaders in these institutions. Dean Miti, what are you doing to make sure that you raise awareness in terms of condomize, in terms of sexual reproductive health rights um, at the institution and on, and on campus? Thank you, Vanessa. Um, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure interacting and discussing such issues which are very critical for our youth today and very critical for our students in higher education institutions. Uh, as you know, higher education institutions, you have uh, a lot of uh, the youth of, uh, of the country and uh, many of them are still trying to get to grips with uh, the challenges related to uh, sexual reproductive uh, rights. Yes. Um, so we, we have uh, wide programs that, uh, that cater for that, uh, including the peer education uh, network, including um, the SRC, the Student Representative Council, where we, we have specific programs that target uh, our students in terms of raising their awareness um, in terms of uh, the, the sexual reproductive health. Um, even though most of our students have now moved uh, from campuses to, to be at home, we're still reaching out to them and are still able to interact with them virtually. Okay, on that, just to find out now, during this lockdown and COVID time situations, <coughs> how are you now reaching out? What are some of the platforms that you are using? As we can see that today, say what has digi it's digitalized this platform to make sure that it reaches a lot of students. So also on campus, since now they're not on campus, they're also e-learning and at home. How are you reaching out to these students? We at Africa University have been very fortunate uh, in that we had started uh, rolling out online programs even before uh, the onset of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so our students were already um, sort of mentally prepared for learning some of their modules online or parts of their modules online. Uh, so the online uh, or the virtual space was not like a strange space for them when they went home and they had to do 100% online interaction with us. Um, but what we went on to do, especially for our new students, is we created communities virtual communities for our students where we put them in uh, groups of uh, between 20 and 30 and we then in each community we, we call them uh, community of learners in each community we have uh, leaders who we train in different uh, different skills you know like um, first aid um, mental health first aid okay. like uh, peer counseling like uh, productive um, health issues and then they lead within these communities uh, and assist those students and they are the first port of call if there is any issue uh, because it's among themselves as students and then it filters through through the system so they're doing that virtually whilst they are in their homes Okay, that sounds really interesting as we have seen and heard what other institutions are also doing at their institutions and hopefully um, these mechanisms are also mechanisms that are working out. Very effective. They are very effective. Sometimes uh, as their dinner is sometimes followed through the groups, the different groups, and you see the interaction between this and among the students. It's very helpful. They, 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 you know, young, young women and young men, our youths, they are very creative. Sometimes you actually see them taking each other through different steps in terms of the solving the problems that they are having. Mm -hmm. And you actually borrow a few tricks from them. From them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Dimitri. It was a pleasure having you here at the Condomines Desk. 
Thank you. Hi guys, my name is Jadel. Hi guys, my name is Maya. Child abuse must come to your store. If you have been abused, call the same white call center number 577 if in case of abuse.